people sing, we'll have a good time tonight in the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to sing Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Yes, sir, it is. Amen. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you for being here tonight. My, it sure is good to see all of you here in the house of the Lord. I trust you've had a good day. These showers of blessing are coming in, and of course, with them comes with that humidity, but it's okay. It's about summertime anyway, and we're thankful for all of God's blessings, aren't we? We ought to be. I'm telling you, God has blessed us in so, so many ways. So let's pray and thank him for our time together tonight and ask him to help us as we look into his word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wonderful privilege to be in your house tonight. You've been so good to us in so many ways. And Lord, I think about those blessings that you've bestowed upon us so many in so many different ways. We think about the weather, and Lord, so many times we talk about the weather, but Lord, you take care of us in so many other different ways that we, uh, Lord, so many times are not even consciously aware of, Lord, how you provide for everything, our air that we breathe, and uh, Lord, our daily substance, and Lord, how you watch over and take care of us, and Lord, and protect us, and provide for us, and Lord, uh, all the things that you do. I was just thinking, Lord, today as I talked to a dear lady, how you, uh, Lord, intervened in her life to provide for her several years ago. And now, uh, Lord, she is able to help someone in her life uh, that needs it desperately. And I'm just grateful, Lord, for your providence. Lord, how you work in our lives. And, Lord, I'm just so thankful, so thankful for all that you do. You are a great God. And, Lord, uh, we so many times just take you for granted, and so many times we fail to thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. And, Lord, I just want to praise you for how you watch over us, take care of us, and, Lord, all the other things that you do that we uh, just take for granted living here in America. Lord, we've been blessed so much, and yet, uh, Lord, we are so careless and so wasteful in so many ways of your bountiful blessings, Lord, here in our lives, here in America. I pray, Lord, that we would be thankful more, and, Lord, we'd honor you more in all that we do. Bless us, Lord, now as we study your word together. I want to thank you, Lord, for this study we've been endeavoring upon. And, Lord, I pray that you just harness our thoughts, our minds, our hearts tonight as we look into your word and bless us together as we look at it for your glory, quicken us and and uh, Lord, help us tonight, and we'll praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen. 
Well, I tell you, I've been studying today and looking into the Word of God, and I've been thankful for what the Lord has been showing me. I've been excited about coming over here and sharing it with you. I've been in my office over there at the house, and, and I tell you, it's been good. It's been a good day studying God's Word, and I've been grateful and thankful for how God has been showing me some things. We're in Acts chapter number 27 tonight. Acts chapter number 27. Been looking at the book of Acts now for several weeks, and we've been looking at, uh, of course, uh, our changing world, how, of course, how God wants to use us in this changing world. And I'm thankful for how to change your changing world, how God can use us to change our changing world in a right way. You know, there's many changing things in our changing world uh, for the wrong. There's a lot of wrong changes happening in our changing world. But I'm glad God wants to use us to change it for the right way and change it for the right things and change things the right way. We're in chapter number 27 tonight. And in chapter number 27, it's a great, great chapter because it's one of the most unusual passages in the whole Word of God. Because in this chapter, we're going to see an encounter with one of the, uh, I guess, one of the nature things, of course, one of the ancient sea journeys. And it contains one of the most unusual facts about the first century seamen. And, of course, it's going to encounter one of the greatest storms that's recorded in history. And, of course, one of the greatest storms that's recorded in the Bible. And we're going to talk about enduring storms in a changing world. How do you endure storms? How do you encounter storms? And how do you endure them? I, I remember Brother Ricky Harris preaching from this chapter, and he talked about storms. And I still remember that sermon. Ain't that wonderful? I'm thankful that we can remember uh, sermons from the Word of God and we can remember things that God teaches us from His Word. And I'm thankful for that because it helps us when God teaches us from His Word and reminds us of great things. And tonight I hope you'll gather some things, garner some things from this chapter that will help you in things to come. Of course, this chapter picks up the story of the Apostle Paul. When we left him last week, he had shared his testimony with Festus and King Agrippa and, of course, Bernice. And, of course, uh, almost thou persuadest me to be, be a Christian, King Agrippa told him. And, of course, Paul said, I wish to award not only almost, but altogether you were like me except in these bonds, he said. And, of course... They, uh, they reasoned and talked with themselves, him and Festus, and, and said, Lord, uh, if, he, if he hadn't uh, appealed to go to uh, Caesar, he might be released. But, of course, God's got a plan for Paul, and it is to appear in Rome. And, of course, it is to write the book of Romans. It is to go on further and voyage to Rome, and God's going to use him tremendously. And we're going to see that tonight in chapter number 27. This, this chapter, of course, is going to... Uh, take us and in, uh, in this journey begin his journey toward Rome and after hearing his appeal of course or hearing his case uh, to try to determine what he's going to write the charges Festus is uh, to send him to Caesar of course he commissions this centurion we're going to see here in chapter 27 to take him to Rome so let's dive in tonight and let's talk about enduring storms in a changing world and as we endure storms in a changing world, I want you to see, when you encounter storms, what's the first thing you do? Well, what do you do when you encounter a storm in your life? I, I don't know about you, but one of the first things I do is I, I, I want to realize why I'm in that storm and maybe readjust my course. I, realize what's happening in my life. I, I want to see what's happening in my life. I check up is what I do. I check up, Lord. Why am I in this storm? What are you wanting to show me in this storm? And what is happening in my storm? What do I need to do? What do I need to adjust? What do I need to reconsider? What do you want to show me? Because you see, there's not a storm that happens in the life of the child of God by accident. Can I say that again? There's not a storm that happens in your life and my life as a child of God by accident. God allows storms to come in our lives, sometimes big storms, sometimes little storms, sometimes little skirmishes, sometimes showers of blessings. 
Uh, but there's not a storm that happens in our lives by accident. Now, sometimes we don't know the reason behind storms, but God has purpose and God has a plan. And when we look at the people in the Word of God and we see them and we see what they went through in life, we wonder sometimes why in the world they went through those storms in life. And then later we see the reason why. But we don't always, of course, we don't always see the reason in our lives when we go through storms. But sometimes we have to readjust, readjust our course in life. Uh, we, we have to readjust what's happening in our lives. But in that, of course, God is still using and trying to show us something. Look at it. Acts chapter 27, verse number 1. And when it was determined that we should, set, uh, we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustus band. Now I want you to notice a couple of things in this verse. We'll move on right quickly. Do you notice the word we back in this verse, back in this chapter? And that word we, of course, draws our attention back to the fact that Luke is back with the apostle Paul. Now, Paul had been in Caesarea for over two years. Now I want you to see this map. And you're going to see a, a passage of scripture and then a map, a passage of scripture and then a map. And there's a reason for that because I'm going to take you along the way. It's going to be hard to see that map probably from a distance, but maybe you can see it. And I've got a color map as well. Down here on the bottom right hand side, you'll see that little mark of red. And that's where Paul begins his journey. And then up to the upper left hand side, you'll see that other little mark of red. And that's where he's going to end that journey. And of course, it's a long way by sea. But of course, on this colored map, you'll see that same indication of this red line of that journey that he's going to take all the way from Caesarea all the way to Rome. And it's a long winding red a line there that's going to take him to Rome. It's a twist and turn that's going to take him to Rome. Sometime the road uh, that God has for us and the road of God's will sometimes is not a straight, short, point-to-point -point place like we'd want it to be. Sometimes it twists and turns along the life of way. But here, of course, now Luke is with him and entering into a ship the Bible tells us we launched meeting to sail by the coast of Asia. One Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. Aristarchus, of course, is a fellow laborer of Paul's. We find that in the book of Philemon, chapter number 24. And, of course, verse number 3. And the next day we touch Sidon. Now look at this map. You'll see it again. They've started sailing. They're not going very far, very fast, but they're going up the coast of Israel. What we know is Israel today. And Julius courteously uh, courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberties to go unto his friends to refresh himself. That's amazing. Julius, of course, is this centurion, and many people believe that Paul led him to the Lord. And, uh, of course, you're going to see some other reasons why as we go along the way that Paul, of course, is entreating him and Paul is witnessing to him and Paul is, of course, trying to win him. And you'll find some other reasons why we believe that Paul did win him to the Lord along this journey. Verse number four. When we had launched from thence, we sailed unto Cyprus, under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we went. Uh, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. Now the Bible shows us here in this map. You'll see it how they're sailing away, and of course they're sailing up, staying close to the coast because of the winds are not uh, commodious to them. The Bible tells us that Paul uh, Luke writes that in this book, verse number six. And there, there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing unto into Italy, and he put us therein. Now he's going to put them on a different ship, and they're heading their hope directly toward Italy. But God has different plans for Paul. He's going to allow him to go through a storm. Do you go through storms in your life? Well, certainly you do. We all encounter storms along life's way. Sometimes we wonder why. And we're going to find out the reason why in Paul's life that he encounters this storm. You and I encounter storms along life's way too. Sometimes we don't know why. 
but they are storms that happen in our lives. I got a phone call Monday night. Terrible, terrible storm in a dear family's life that I've known for many, many years. And it hurts me. It broke my heart to hear the sad, sad news of this family, of a tragedy that swept in their home. It literally, literally broke my heart to think of what happened in this family's life. But storms do happen. Storms do happen in some of the most unusual and some of the sweetest homes that we know of. Uh, storms happen. Storms come our way. Now look at it, verse 7. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against uh, Nidus, the winds not suffering us, we sailed unto Crete over against Salmoni. Now look at the map again. You'll see it, of course, on this map at the right-hand side up near the top there. They've left, of course, uh, Nidus, and they've sailed down, and they're going to try to sail straight on across toward Italy, but the winds were contrary. The winds wouldn't let them, so now they've been forced to go down toward Crete, that little island of Crete. Verse number 8, And hardly passing it came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now, several days of difficult sailing has left them at this little, uh, I say little, it's an island of Crete. And now Paul is having to uh, uh, make his way and make his journey. He's enduring the storms along the way. Of course, he's just a passenger on the ship. And he's probably one of the, uh, one of the rare passengers on the ship. You see, he is a, if I can say it this way, a Roman prisoner. All of these other prisoners that are with him are probably not Romans. They're going to probably turn into gladiators and probably fed the lions. But Paul, of course, is a Roman citizen. And, of course, the centurion recognizes that, the guy that's in charge of him. And so he's given some, some fair, uh, fair leniency. But, of course, he's enduring these storms. And these storms are having a, a uh, taxing Ability on him getting to Rome. Sometimes storms delay us in our plans. Sometimes storms direct us in our lives. Sometimes storms do different things in our lives that we cannot understand. Storms have a way of doing some of the most uh, awful things, but sometimes some of the wonderful things in our lives. Now you're going to see some things happen in Paul's life here that's going to help him in his witness for the Savior, but it's also going to help him bring folks to the Savior. It's going to help him in his testimony, I believe, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's amazing how God puts us or allows us to go through storms in life. And sometimes we get tired of storms. Do you? You get tired of storms? I, I just have to be honest with you tonight. I get tired of hearing about storms. I get tired of enduring storms. Sometimes I get tired of storms. Now, I love refreshing showers of blessings, don't you? I enjoyed the rain uh, yesterday. And today, I actually got out in the rain yesterday. As a kid, I used to play in the rain. You remember that? Y'all remember that? Some of you shaking your head. Yeah, I can imagine you being out playing in the rain. Sometime our kids still love to get out and play in the rain. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm telling you, playing in the mud holes uh, sometime as kids, we used to enjoy that. My mother used to get on to us so bad, stomping in the mud puddles as the little boys as we were. But we always enjoyed playing in the rain, it seemed like. But as we grew older, we got away from that. I got out and played in the rain yesterday. I washed windows. It's a good time to wash windows when you're in the rain because you're going to get wet anyway. Why not, Brother Johnny? Huh? That's what I did, and I enjoyed it. I really did. I enjoyed it. wasn't too hot. wasn't too cold, and I just enjoyed it. I thought, well, I'm going to get wet anyway, so I enjoyed it. But, but you know, uh, the showers of blessing are always good, but, boy, when they turn into storms and rainstorms and thunderstorms and tornadoes and hurricanes, and they threaten your life. Boy, you get scared then. It changes things, don't it? And when you see the damage that they do, boy, it makes you wonder. Oh, it makes you worry. Sometimes we encounter the storms of life. I'm glad I'm going somewhere 
one of these days where there will be no more storms. No more storms. Hallelujah. The Bible talks about it in Revelation chapter 21. I've read these verses many, many times. Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 1. The Bible said, I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away and there was, listen to this, no more sea. Hmm. Why is that important, preacher? Because every storm we have comes from a body of water somewhere. It comes from a sea. How about that? We're going to a place where there won't be no more storms. Hallelujah. Well, when we encounter the storms of life, I want to remind you of this. When you encounter the storms of life, endure the storms and uh, remain. Remain. Endure. Remain. That's what that endure means. Remain in, in existence. Endure the storms of life. Readjust. Sometimes we have to readjust to remain. That's what we have to do. We have to readjust to endure. Sometimes we have to. And then here's the second thing I want you to see in these verses 9 through 26. And that is to, 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 to reaffirm or reaffirm yourself in the will of God. That word reaffirm literally means to state again as fact. It's literally what it means. State again as fact. Now, we know, of course, that the will of God is the best thing for us, don't we? We as Christians know that. We've, uh, we've settled that many times in our lives, and we know that from the Word of God we know that. But sometimes we get in a storm, boy, and doubt comes along to make us wonder. But Paul didn't. He reaffirmed himself all through this journey. Even in the storms and even in all these changes in course, he reaffirmed himself. Now watch this, verse number nine. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast, that's the, the Pentecostal fast, what was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of landing and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than the thing than those things which were spoken by Paul. You notice what happened here? Paul told him. He's staying true, of course, to the man that he is, and he knows. He knows about Shipwrecks. He knows about what it's like to be on the sea. And yet he's just trying to give them. He's not trying to be a smart aleck. He's not trying to, trying to overtake the ship or anything like that. He's just trying to give them some sound advice. The Day of Atonement fast is past. And, of course, now they're sailing. They've, they've been in the winter. The winter's approaching. Paul says this ain't the best time to sail. I'm trying to give you a little word of advice here. And he said, I perceive that the voyage is going to be of hurt. Not only to the ship, not only of what's all, but hurt to us as well. And they wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't take his advice. You know, sometimes it pays us to listen to advice, especially of godly people. But they wouldn't. The Bible tells us here that the centurion, he listened to the owner of the ship, he listened to others, and they wouldn't listen to him. You, you know, Paul talked about, in the book of Second Corinthians, he talked about he had been a night and a day in the deep. He'd been shipwrecked before three times. So he knew what he's talking about. And he's trying to tell them. Verse number 12. And because they, the haven was not commodious to winter in, the, part, uh, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain Phanas, and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south winds blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosening thence, they sailed close to Crete. Now, don't you look at this map again. They're on the bottom side of Crete. They've left the Fair Havens. They've sailed about 40 miles. And now it seems like, well, the winds are going to be okay, and we can take off toward Italy. 
And so they loosen up and they take off out to sea. That's what he means there in verse number 13. They obtain their purpose is what the Bible says there in that verse. In other words, uh, we've got it figured out now, Paul. The winds have turned loose and we've loosened up. And now they're sailing close to Crete. They hadn't left Crete totally yet, but we're taking off. We're sailing on out. Everything looks good now. I mean, we're headed out. We've left out, and we're, we're headed on out past Phoenix, and we're, we're taking on off. Well, it all sounds good until you get to verse 14. And when you get to verse 14, they're headed out to sea. Something tragic happens. Look at it. Verse 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. Eurocladon, man, is one of those, uh, I guess you could say they, they typed that hurricane and named it. <laughs> I guess that's what we'd say in modern day terms. And when the, the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Now, I'm not going to make any comments there about the last part of that verse. <clears throat> I'm going to stay out of trouble right there. Sister Karen's shaking her head. We're going to move on. Uh, verse 16, And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. Which when they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, uh, straight sail, and so were driven. And when being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. Now you notice what's happening here? I've got this map again. Now look, this wind is pushing them on out. It's pushing them on out. They got caught up in this hurricane, I want to say, a hurricane at sea, and it's just pushing them. It's just driving them. They have no control now over the boat, and it's just driving them on out to sea. The Bible tells us here they are caught up in this storm. They're caught up in this storm bad. I mean, they're caught up in this storm awfully. And, boy, I'm telling you, uh, they, they don't know what to do now. Verse number 19. In the third day, we cast out uh, with our own hands the tackling of the ship. They're trying to lighten the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appear, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. You see what's happening? They're pushing further and further out to sea. They're in a whirlwind like they've never been. You ever been there in your life? Man, I'm telling you, we can't see daylight. We can't see dark. I don't know if I'm coming or I don't know if I'm going. I'm in a storm. I don't know what's happening. What do you do in that storm, preacher? What do you do when that storm hits like that? The tragedies of life sometimes puts us in that storm. What do you do? i tell you what you do. You reaffirm yourself in the will of God. You reaffirm yourself in the will of God. You remember what I said reaffirm is? To confirm or validate, to restate what you know is true about the will of God in your life. I've had to do that in my own life at times. I've had to reassure myself or reaffirm myself that is Tell God, now, Lord, I know I'm your child. I take him back to the place where he saved my soul. I don't know what's happening now in my life, Lord. I don't know what's going on now. I can't see daylight. I can't see dark. I can't see the sunshine. I can't see the flowers blooming. I can't hear the birds singing, but I do know this. I'm still your child. You see what's happening? In the storms of life, you reaffirm yourself. In God's will, I know I'm still your child, and I know you're still in control. Watch this. The Bible talks about it here. Paul, of course, he has no compass. He don't know the sun, the moon, the stars. They, they have nothing to navigate by. They're in a raging storm, and all hope 
is gone. I want to tell you, you can live. You can live. I, I was going to look it up, but I forgot to. You can live so many days without uh, uh, water. You can live so many days without food. You can live so many days without uh, air. No, you can't live much long. You, live, you can't live days. You live so many minutes without air. But you can't live very long without hope. You really can't. It's just what gets a lot of people. Depression. They lose hope. They lose hope. You got to have hope in something. Somebody. Something. Somewhere. You got to have hope. The Bible says it here. All hope that we should be saved was taken away. We're just not, not going to be saved. How are we going to make it? Now they don't know how they're going to make it. Look at it. Verse number 21. But after a long abstinence, Paul's found a quiet place alone. It ain't quiet, but he's found a place away from everybody else. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said these words. Listen to them. Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. He's not rubbing it in and have not loose from Crete. No, he's saying this, to have gained this harm or loss. Now watch this, verse 22. And now I exhort you to what? This is how we know he's not rubbing it in. Now I exhort you to be of good cheer. You notice what he said here? Paul's not rubbing it in. He's not saying I told you so. No, if he was saying I told you so, he wouldn't have said nothing else. I told you so. I told you so. We shouldn't have left Crete. Now we're all going to be lost. Now we're all going to die. Now we're all going to perish. That's the I told you so attitude. That's not what Paul's saying. He said, I told you we shouldn't have left Crete. Man, we're, 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 we're in a mess now. But then he says, hey, be of good cheer. I got some good news for us. Hey, I got some good news. Wake up here. Wait a minute, fellas. Don't throw in the towel. I got some good news. God's always got some good news. Do you know what? For this old sin curse, sin tossed, topsy turvy in a, in a hellacious storm world, God's got some good news. God's got some good news. You and I got some good news to tell them. Look at it. Now I exhort you, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. There it is again. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. You notice what he told him? He's reaffirming this again. He's confirming. He's validating. Of course, he's showing them the establishment of who he is and establishment of the promise that God has made him. He's testifying of who God is in his life. He's witnessing to the power of God, even in the midst of the storm. Do we do that? I wonder. I look back on my life and I wonder how many times in the storms of life have I truly been a witness for God. Oh, God, help me. Oh, I'm ashamed to say. Oh, man. How many times have I boldly stood up and said, Oh, God is my refuge and strength in the midst of this storm. God's still in control. But Paul did. Paul did. He reaffirmed those folks that was with him. He says, Oh, it's okay. God's been with me. God stood with me tonight. And I got some good news. God's going to take care of us. Now, the bad news is we're going to lose the ship and we're going to end up on an island. But the good news is, if y'all listen, stay close now. Not going to lose a single life. You listening? Oh, you see. Enduring storms in a changing world, sometimes we have to readjust the course. Staying in God's will. And then sometimes we have to reaffirm ourselves in the will of God because it may get worse before it gets better. Stay reaffirmed in God's will. Here's the last part I'm done. Remember, God's still in control. 
That's 27 through 44. Remember, God's still in control. You see, God's still got this thing. People, I'm telling you, people get all nervous, get all out of shape. huh? We get all, oh, what are we going to do? God's still in control. And I, I have to admit, sometimes I get a little shaky myself. I have to, hey, I have to find that place alone with God and remind myself God's still in control. Verse 27, but when the 14th night was come, now think about that, 14 nights. That's two weeks, man. 14 nights of this. Can you imagine that? That's a long time. When the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in a dim, about midnight the shipmen deemed that we they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. That's 120 feet deep. And when they found uh, had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 th- fathoms. That's 90 feet. And then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wish for the day. Boy, they're hoping and praying. Boy, I'm telling you, they're fearing they're going to run aground some rocky place. So they throw out the, uh, the four anchors and they're praying for daylight. Verse 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under cover as though they would have cast anchors out of the fourth ship, Paul said unto the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, they cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boats and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you have tarried and continued fast, having taken nothing. You notice what's happening? It's about to get daylight, and they're afraid the ship's going to be broken up, and they're going to perish, so they start getting out the lifeboats, and some of them start getting in the lifeboats, and Paul said, no, 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 we need to all stay together or else they'll perish. And the centurion listens. Captain and centurion listens, so he cut the boats loose. They're all staying together. He says, what we need to do now is eat, brethren, because we got a hard day ahead of us. Daylight gets here. It's going to be a hard day. And so they start eating. Verse 34. Wherefore, I pray you, take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. You notice what he says here? They hadn't eaten for 14 days. They've been worried, been fasting, been praying. I mean, they've been agonized with a storm. They've been working, trying their best just to survive. And now, of course, they're, they're about to come to this island and the ship's about to break up. And, and, and Paul says, it's time to eat now, brethren. And so he starts to eat and he tells them, you need to eat too. And he says, you need to take some, something for your health. He says, because, hey, it's not a hair of your head going to be hurt, what we're about to go through. You notice what he's doing? He's telling them about the providence of God that God has promised them. It's sort of like the testimony that you and I have for those that are lost if they'll trust God. Isn't that amazing what we could tell folks? Now, I'm not talking about this present world. He's talking about the present world, what what they're about to go through. But we're talking about the storm of judgment that's coming that God can preserve those that trust him. Ain't that amazing? Now look at it, verse 35. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And when and we were in all in the ship, 200, three score, and 16 souls. That's 276 people. And when they had eaten enough, They lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. They're lightening the ship. They're throwing everything else over, still trying to hold on. Verse 39. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosened the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail 
uh, to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and forepart stuck fast and remainder unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim out and escape. You notice what the command is? Let's kill all the prisoners. We're responsible for them, and if they escape, man, we'll lose our life. But you notice what's going to happen here, verse 43. But the centurion, this is Julius, and this is one of the reasons we think he was saved, that Paul had won him. Willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land and the rest, some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. The Bible tells us, of course, the centurion commanded all of them to jump overboard and swim to land. If you can't swim, get you a piece of board or a plank and float to land. And uh, they're going to end up on this little island of Malta. And we're going to find out next week what God does in their lives and how God uses Paul even greater to show them the truth of who he is, what God has done in his life, and how God can use you and I in this changing world, even in the midst of storms. And even in the midst of our lives to show people the truth about God and what he wants to do in their lives as well. You know, it's amazing how God can use us to endure the storms of life to show people, uh, point people to Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the life of the Apostle Paul. Even in the midst of a terrible storm, you used him greatly to point people to you. And Lord, may you use us in the midst of our storms, regardless of what they be, how they be. Lord, to point people to you as we trust you and we reaffirm your will in our lives, even in the midst of storms. And Lord, we realize that you're still in control. In the midst of all of our storms, Lord, you're still in control. Help us, Lord, to show that and tell that and live that to a lost and dying world. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.